Well, I'm very glad to be here and rounding out a rock star session. Um, my paper is pretty brief. Um, it's just work that we're just starting with my co-author, Kelsey Jack. So I'll get you guys off to lunch on schedule, I think. Um, I'm sure Dan will be doing that as well. Uh, so the paper is called Do Donors Prefer In Kind? And we're looking at a field experiment on paternalistic giving. And this is based on the fact that we're all in this room because philanthropy is really defined by voluntary giving on one hand, and yet on the other hand, the giving rarely occurs without terms on how that money is used, right? And um, Nick Epley alluded to this idea of paternalism and the idea that we tend to constrain our donations or that the organization tends to have terms on it when he talked about his paternalistic ex um, experiment and survey using GiveDirectly. And GiveDirectly really recently has been the one that caused a stir. Like this idea, should we just give people cash? Do they know what's best for them the <coughs> as the recipients, right? And so there's this ongoing debate. And it's very much at odds with the model we have for philanthropy. Most, you know, most nonprofits, you guys as practitioners know, we, we define ourselves by providing a specific transfer for a specific outcome, right? And we can call these broadly, broadly tied transfers, right? It's this idea that the giving limits some of the recipient's auto autonomy. And I don't mean that in a forceful way. Sometimes that is just the model that is. And we can go a little bit beyond that in the idea that the donors have this idea of paternalism in mind, in that they, they kind of have in their head what they'd like the outcome to be, right? They give and they think this is the best for you. And there's, there's numerous examples of this. Um, in kind are the idea that we give them something, a good or a service. Often the tide transfer comes conditional, so you get cash, but it's conditional on sort of jumping through a hoop or over a hurdle, going to school a certain amount of times, these kind of things. Health aid, food for the homeless and impoverished, these educational supplies, mosquito nets, these are, these are kind of canonical examples of tide transfer. And, and these are going to be helping the recipients, and they're also meeting the donor's goals. So our question says, sometimes that is the right outcome, and that can be the win-win. Sometimes there's a trade-off, right? So when we are providing these tie transfers, do we find a trade-off between the donors and the recipients? Well, we want to think about the recipient side. So do recipients prefer the tie transfers or the cash? We can think that there's probably examples of both and context for both. Um, we really want to think about the welfare outcomes here on the recipient side. Would they change their behavior if you give them cash versus this value, the same value of some in time or tie transfer? Right? So we're going to be looking at the behavioral outcome or the consumption patterns of the recipient. And then on the other hand, do, do, do donors prefer tie transfer to just giving cash? And I think our intuition, as Nick mentioned, is probably a lot of the practitioners in the, in the room feel, and I'd love to hear your feedback on this, is that the donors do drive a lot of this. Donors like the idea that they're giving to something for a specific reason, not just handing over their cash to somebody else to let them use the cash however they want, right? So our, our, our kind of baseline thought is that that's, that model is the way it is, because donors want it that way, but we haven't really tested this explicitly. So that's what we'd like to look at. Okay, so how would this distort consumption on the research to the inside? Well, we think that these are probably actually equal and equivalent in some cases, and that's if the recipients are rational and well-informed decision makers, right? And if the, the in-kind or the conditional transfers are inframarginal. All that means is they would have consumed that much anyway. So I have to eat a certain amount every day. If you give me some extra apples, I will probably have, I would have consumed those apples anyway and I just won't buy apples and I'll use that money on something else, right? That means them for a marginal. If you give me 10 bushels of apples, then they'll probably go bad and I won't have been able to switch and, and, and fungibility, you know, use that as something else. And then the last one is fungibility. If I do get too many apples, perhaps I could just sell them and instead they go bad. And if I can do that perfectly, then it doesn't matter to me either. Give me a lot of apples, that's great. I'll sell them and do the, what I want with the cash, right? Um, is there evidence of this? We see mixed evidence. Um, in these cases in which they're inframarginal, most of the time this doesn't distort consumption, which makes sense. If I get just one extra apple, 
that's fine, it's inframarginal, I would have eaten an apple anyway. Um, we see some mixed results in which the recipients do change their preferences, and one way that we see this, and this is in the lab, is that they don't often treat them as fungible if they seek it as a budget item. So sometimes we can anchor in our minds the amount that we need to spend on food or the amount we need to spend on education. And if we anchor that for the recipient, sometimes they will change their behavior because that's, that reference point has changed. So we see some mixed evidence that it does change their exposure. Um, from the standpoint of the donor, we would see numerous reasons why the donor might prefer high transfers. Uh, they might simply have a preference for control. And that is a legitimate mechanism, I think, from the, the donor standpoint, um, there might be this belief that the recipients lack information or self-control. They don't know what's good for themselves. This is the other minds problem we were hearing so much about yesterday, yesterday, right? And whether we know that or they know that is, you know, up for open question and debate. And then there might just be a warm glow. I think there's some a sense in which the tangibility of giving a mosquito net or food or education makes me feel better than me just giving cash to them and knowing that they'll probably spend it on that anyhow, right? So those are reasons why donors, I think, really have a feeling for giving a thing versus cash. And we see evidence of this as well. Donors do tend to provide, provide, prefer these income transfers. However, it's never been done in the field as far as we know. So that's where we're moving towards. Okay. So we're testing cash versus tie transfers, and it is a very, very simple fundraising campaign, okay? <coughs> we are going to offer people a cash transfer option when they donate, a food option, so they are gonna give their money to buy food for these people, or actually we're gonna allow them to have a choice. So when it comes to giving their donation, they can choose between them, okay? So what will we look? Um, we have a model behind this, but essentially we're gonna think about how much, how many people give in each of these treatments. So do I get more numbers of donors in each case? And then the amount. So this is very, this parallel is probably all the talks you've been seeing. We think about how many donors and then the size of their gifts, right? And we can compare all these, our different treatment options to see which one pushes forward the margin as more, right? That's what that says. Um, we have a very nice research setting right now, at least for the partner side of it. Um, we're working with Innovation for Poverty Action, which is a nonprofit. They set up development in numerous locations worldwide. And this one's with farming households in Zambia. And they're doing a randomized control tri trial where they're giving some households food and giving some households cash and seeing how their outcomes change. Um, my my co-author, Kelsey Jack, is the main person on that. And it's a fantastic paper. I highly recommend you go find out about that. You can go to the website if you have, if you have further questions. We're going to think a little bit more on the donor side. So we designed this really nice website um, with the help of our research assistant to garner donations for this project. And as you can see, if I can move this around, I think it's the best. You can go, you get lots of information about the project. You can click on the, the mission and FAQ, and you can donate in a couple of places. Okay? And we beta tested this with our friends and researchers and, and, and really put a lot of effort into kind of De developing this so it would be a very realistic way to get, get donations. <coughs> At which point, if you click on this donate button, you get instantly randomized into one of the three treatments. And you don't know that you're in, a tre in, in the treatment. So one would be that you're gonna be donating food. Now here it clearly says that you're not actually sending them food, you're sending money that at which point we will buy them food <laughs> in Zambia and deliver it for you on your behalf. One is to, the other one is to donate cash, so I will give you cash, which will then go directly to cash to these farmers. And the last one is this choice. I would donate cash or I will donate food, at which point you click on one of those, it takes you to another third party in which to donate, right? Okay, so there's huge advantages to being able to, to collect donations online. I'm guessing every organization here at the workshop has a website and tries to collect donations on, online. Um, great visual materials, reduces the social and time pressure, um, the, the pressure of asking people, the, the intimidation factor or guilt factors, all those kind of things. Very low co cost of one. There are also huge downsides, and we're running into those downsides right now. It's very difficult, and we're having a hard time attracting donors to this website. The program is not very well known. We may lack legitimacy, and so our emails have been almost exclusively ignored. 
Um, and then once we get people to the websites, we're, we're having a very difficult time retaining them there. So this actually mirrors Jonathan's cautionary tale <laughs> in that although we use a lot of advertising, we send out emails, we're using Facebook, and we can see that we've reached, we reach tens of thousands of people every week according to this metric, right? So how many people reach, re how many people click, these kind of things. Once we get them to our website, few go beyond the landing page. So you can see this is in the last, I captured this, this is the last three weeks. We have 175, or uh, 1,750 sessions that come to that website and see that beautiful landing page, and only 44 click beyond that page, right? And then it goes down and down and down. So how bad is this? So our email response rate, we send out 2,500 emails. We did send out more. We sent them twice, a reminder, only one person came to our website, and nobody, and nobody donated. Through social media, in the last month, we had 40,000 view the ad, 4.5% visited the website, which is decent, but quickly they bounce away and we only got two donations, okay? So this is problematic. There's a lot of resources spent trying to get this. And we're, we're running into that very, those upfront costs where we're not a big organization and we're not able to um, have the credibility and the reach and the legitimacy that probably a lot of your organizations, you went through this, this early phase where you're building up your, your client base and you're building up your donor base and your warm list and these kind of things, right? We don't have that luxury. We don't have that, I hesitate to even call it luxury. We don't have that, that, that build up that we've worked for us and I know that a lot of you guys have built for us. So um, where do we go from here? Well, we've worked with a few other people to stimulate additional web, website visits. Uh, we're going to work on having some blog posts on some fairly renowned sites such that we can talk about the recipient side. So we'll talk about the experiment in Zambia and try to direct people towards this website in order to get more clicks and more people actually donating so that we can see and make some inference about the different, the different tests. Um, we can do even more targeted email lists. That's an option. But what we're going towards right now is this idea that we'd actually like to think about having an additional partner. Um, and so one that has this more existing donor base and a willingness to implement the parallel cash and kind of program. And I guess this is the, my moment to put in a little bit of a pitch for an opportunity for another spy partnership. Um, our current program is going to be completed in the coming months as well. So with the Zambia project, we won't have the opportunity to fundraise legitimately for them. And it's very important to us, you know, as, as economists, we have all this go through our IRB, our ethics board approvals, and we're, we legitimately want to be giving this money and, and will be giving this money to these projects. So we would like to spend our time and our efforts and our resources helping you learn as a practitioner and putting our, these, this funding towards something that could be raising you guys money as well as learning about this. Um, we do think that there's some times where giving cash may be the best option. That, that both the beneficiaries and your organization could benefit from it because giving cash is very cost effective. One of the things I didn't go into is, and you probably know, is that delivering in-kind goods and services can be very expensive and there are times when cash can be the better option. So. We're hoping that if, with the possibility of partnering with you, we could learn more about when donors are open to this, which kind of donors are open to this and when. Um, we'd love to bring our funding and technical skills to bear on that, and we know that there's a room for this hybrid model. We just would love if you have you know, this opportunity or some <coughs> ideas with your organization to, to learn about that. So with that, let's do this, and thanks. <laughs>
this is a question, exactly that question, <coughs> in kind versus, um, you know. I think this is a great opportunity for a clarification. I think there are two aspects here that you, you just hit really, really clearly on something that I should clarify. I think there's the idea that as a donor, I go to my pantry and I get food, or I know that there's lots of like glasses donation things. I go and my, look in my drawer and I'm like, oh, these are my old glasses. I will donate them to somebody else who needs them. And I agree with you then we can think about whether the people would give cash instead. What, what I also want to study, I think this is a very important question, what I'm looking at studying is that you as a food bank would sometimes give your beneficiaries cash instead. So you would actually not hand them food, you would hand them cash. That's a good question. Yeah. And we think a really great opportunity for food banks is this idea around Thanksgiving particularly. Um, we would love to partner with a food bank who typically would provide a Thanksgiving basket of specific items, cranberry sauce, turkey, these kind of things. And yes, the family might want that. No, the family might not want all of it. So we could think about the alternatives between giving the value of the, the Thanksgiving yeah. food basket rather than the Thanksgiving food basket itself. Any other thoughts or questions? Suggestions? This is an open question. I, I don't know if this is really a question as much as an observation. Um, it, it seems you have also stumbled across not only looking at the research questions you're trying to do, but also as a practitioner, I'm a practitioner, the realities of fundraising in the digital space. Um, if somebody has discovered how to fundraise in the digital space, um, they would, we would all know this because that person would be a multimillionaire immediately. Uh, other, than, I guess, other than the Obama campaign and um, the Red Cross only during times of national catastrophic disaster, I know of no other organization that uses digital space to raise significant amount of money that compares to other other realms of fundraising. ALS did okay. Yeah, ALS, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't do it. I was right. say, else. They didn't there, and, and we had that wonderful example. That was the, other, the wonderful example that we just uh, had at the beginning of our conference. But for those of us who are, and I work for a pretty big organization. I, I, in fact, I work for Feeding America, and uh, we wish we knew how to tap the social media. And I don't know uh, from our other practitioners in the room here, you know, uh, uh, you've just stumbled upon something I think that might need, would love to have more experimentation on and love for, uh, I'm just going to say this to all our researchers out there, to look at the digital space as a platform for fundraising and research on it. We need that because right now, I'm going to tell you, most of us are stumbling in the dark and folks like ALS are, are I'm going to say, getting lucky that something has happened, and of course, as I said, uh, 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 President Obama and, and the Red Cross, they just do it because, well, it's a national thing, you know? <laughs> it's, uh, it's much bigger than, absolutely. But, 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 uh, so, so there's, there's I something think, I think you're absolutely right, and we, kind of, we, we knew that, and yet it, is, it, it hit us in the face much more than we expected how hard this was, and what you guys are struggling with, I, I completely <laughs> empathize with now. And I, I am interested in that research, so we can talk afterwards. Um, I think getting people's attention is very difficult. Yes. And, and you know, when you can grab the national spotlight, you have people's attention. If you can pour water over your head, you have people's attention. If there are cute cats, you know, uh, in your video, maybe that's how you get it. <laughs> yeah, I, just to echo what, for the researchers in the room, just echo what he said. I, if there could be a concerted effort to look at how, how online giving and all those other things because we really do, we're just shooting in the dark. And you know, all the stuff that we think, you know, all the stuff that we think that, the, you know, that will draw gets a big goose egg. And you know, and then you just have to start. So is it, is it the technology, is it the message? Is it, there's so many variables that go into it. So that would be really valuable. Sounds like it sounds like we could have a session just on this as a discussion, <laughs> but we will get to we'll, we'll defer to it. <laughs> just adding one sentence to what Paul was saying, and that there was a differentiation between using social media and online giving with repeat donors. At least somebody was given at least once. I think versus that makes the world, you know, in the universe. I think that would be very meaningful. Yeah, we tried to target in our ads. Andrew, do you want to one more question? Uh, last one. Um, 
Yeah, so I, I mean, so we run a crowdfunding platform for scientific research in which a lot of these questions, I guess, come up. And I think, like, one thing that I would suggest to the researchers in the room is um, <coughs> we have requests to, to talk about many different parts of this online giving problem. And it's not just, like, the people in this room, and there's, like, a whole bunch of other researchers out there across a lot of disciplines, from kind of user experience, user design, all the way through to um, kind of the psychology of what somebody gives, through to, like, how do we get better conversion rates on our site, or like our messaging and kind of, so there's all these like different groups that I think would be very helpful in this discussion. Because mm -hmm. we've actually seen it kind of incoming from all sorts, like all, all different fronts of people who are interested in the problem, but are seemingly in different areas of the time research. All right, I'm gonna say uh, thanks everyone for everything. We saw partnership formed, alcoholism.